So let's go ahead and take a look at some properties of the Z-transform. This discussion is very similar to all the other transform properties we've looked at, both in previous classes and in this class. We want to know how things in the Z-domain change as things in the time domain change and vice versa, and just some general properties of the transform in general. A lot of these properties we did a very detailed derivation of when we talked about Fourier transforms. How we would go about deriving these kind of equivalent versions for the Z-transform is very similar. It would usually just involve writing down the definition and kind of doing a lot of algebraic manipulations to show them. So because of that, we're not going to really go through that again. It's really very much the same steps with just slightly different notation. So a lot of these properties, we're just going to state them. They're going to look incredibly familiar to things that you've seen and things that we derived more rigorously before. So many of these should look very familiar to them to you. So in the discussion, what we're going to assume is that we have this discrete time signal x of k whose z transform is x of z. And along with that z transform, we always have to specify the region of convergence, right? That's very important. So the region of convergence associated with x of z will denote r sub x. So think of r sub x as just this kind of set of points in the complex plane that tell me where x of z is well-defined and, and valid. It's not something that blows up. Same for y of k. The discrete time signal y of k in the z domain is y of z, obviously. And the set of points where y of z exists, its region of convergence, will denote those sets of points, that set of points, as ry. It's important to kind of note these different sets because as we work with these different um, transform properties, we not only need to keep track of x of z and y of z, but also rx and ry, and possibly how these regions change. So defining these up front is important. The first property we'll talk about is the linearity property. Just like every other transform that we talk about in this course, the Z-transform is a linear transform. That means if I take a weighted combination of signals in the time domain, I get just a weighted combination of their corresponding Z-transforms. Not too surprising there. What's interesting though, so this isn't too shocking, this line of math right here, the interesting thing for this property is the region of convergence. It turns out that given this linear combination in time, which has this z transform the z domain, the region of convergence is now the intersection of the original region of convergences. So in general, when you intersect two sets of points, remember the intersection means the, th the points that they have in common. So when I intersect these two things, rx and ry, typically I'll end up with a smaller set of points. So Rx intersect Ry consists of only the points that are in Rx and in Ry. So typically when I do this in the time domain to get this Z transform, I'm going to end up with a region of convergence, which in general is smaller. Now, this bullet has a little caveat. And the caveat is it can turn out that I end up with a region of convergence that's actually larger than either Rx or Ry, Ry in a very kind of special situation. And that special situation is when what we call pole zero cancellation occurs. So in a few videos, we'll actually work through a very specific example demonstrating what pole zero cancellation is and how it impacts regions of convergence and how pole zero cancellation can actually cause the region of convergence to get bigger. So we'll, we'll go through that in detail. It can happen. Most of the time it doesn't. And most of the time when you apply this linearity property, the resulting region of convergence is going to be the intersection of the two region of convergences, and it's going to be a region that is smaller in the complex plane. The time reversal property of the Z-transform says if I flip in the time domain, I replace all my Zs with 1 over Z in the Z domain. So that kind of makes sense in a way, right? Positive time is associated with Zs raised to the negative power, Negative time is associated with a z's raised to the positive power. So if I flip my signal about the origin, negative time becomes positive time, positive time becomes negative time. That kind of flips the power of the z's, which is exactly what happens in the z-transform. So if you actually told me, hey, here's x of k, and its z-transform is x of z, now I'm going to do time reversal. What happens to x of z? That's a very easy question to answer. I just have to find every z in my expression and replace every z with 1 over z. What about the region of convergence? Well, the region of convergence inverts as well. So it, cons it consists of everything 
outside of a circle if originally it was inside a circle. So that's what we mean by this kind of one over Rx. And that should make sense, right? If I went from a left-sided signal to a right-sided signal or vice versa, what my region of convergence is going to look like is going to be completely inverted. So this is kind of what we mean by one over Rx. More rigorously, it's captured here in this bullet. The original region of convergence was the sets of points less than B and greater than A. Then the region of convergence of the time reversed signal is this. It's A less than one over magnitude Z less than B, which if you multiply things out, it turns out this is Z, magnitude of Z less than one over B, magnitude of Z less than one over A. So the region of convergence gets inverted. This also does work for B equals infinity or A equals, you know, A equals zero, things like that. So this does work for left or right sided signals. If you have infinity and flip it, you get a zero, etc. You can do different examples to kind of think through that. Next property we want to talk about is the time shift property. This says if I time shift a signal in the time domain, my Z transform remains the same except it gets multiplied by z to the minus k naught. So k naught was how much I shifted in time. And the only thing that happens to my z transform is my original z transform stays there. I just get multiplied by z to the minus k naught. And again, if you think back to the definition of the z transform, this should kind of make sense. The z transform transforms our discrete time signal into a polynomial. So if I shift where my discrete time signal lives on the time axis, this really just kind of shifts the order of my polynomial. And that's exactly what this does right here. The region of convergence remains unchanged, except having to worry about the zero or the infinity part. So if we have k naught greater than zero, then this is going to introduce some poles at z equals zero, and we would need to exclude the point z equals zero. If k is less than zero, so this would be a shift now to the left, then we're going to end up with positive values of z, so z to the 2 to the 3 to the 4, something like that, which means we can't have z equals infinity. So we would need to exclude the point z equals infinity. So in general, the region of convergence is going to remain unchanged, but I might introduce some points z equals 0 or z equals infinity that I need to now exclude from my region of convergence. So it might require me altering just one point or two points. The exponential sequence property, it says if I know my z transform of x of k, but in the time domain I multiply by alpha to the k, what happens to my z transform? It says replace all the z's in your original z transform with z over alpha. So that's interesting. You can almost see this one again. It's like if we write down the definition of this, I have z to the k, or z to the minus k, I also have alpha to the k. It's like I've replaced z to the minus 1 with alpha z to the minus 1. It's like I've replaced it with z over alpha. So I can easily write down the z transform of my sequence x of k that's been multiplied by alpha to the k. What about the region of the convergence? It turns out the region of the convergence gets scaled by the magnitude of alpha as well. So what do we mean by that? Well, if my original region of convergence was the set of points whose magnitude was bigger than a and less than b, then the new region of convergence is the set of points magnitude of z less than magnitude alpha b greater than magnitude alpha a. So this changes the shape or the size of the region of convergence. And actually it does kind of a rotation thing too if this is a complex number. So let's look at that on the So if this was my original z transforms pole in zero location, so we're doing it very simple here, just have one pole and one zero, but now I've created this new sequence by multiplying by alpha to the k, well, what happens? The pole location, in terms of how far away from the origin it is, it changes by a factor magnitude alpha. So this has been changed by a factor magnitude alpha. So has the zero location. It was originally a distance magnitude b away from the origin. Now it's a distance magnitude b magnitude alpha. So depending on whether alpha has a magnitude greater than zero or less than zero, the pole and zero locations are either going to get further away from the origin or get closer to the origin. They're also going to rotate. 
depending on whether alpha is real valued or complex valued, if it's complex valued, the angle of alpha is non-zero, and it's actually going to rotate these pole locations and zero locations to new spots. So that's what ha what's happened over here on the right. The pole location, which was originally here, actually rotated and grew to land there. Same thing here. This pole location that was originally here rotated to land there. So multiplying by some complex number in the time domain actually rotates the pole zero locations and possibly grows or shrinks their magnitude relative to the origin. So those are the first uh, four properties we want to talk about. Linearity, time reversal, time shift, and this exponential sequence property. In the next video, we'll talk about the next four properties of the Z-transform.